This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Yeah, Charmy, why are we doing two chapters? Uh, for a lot of the reasons we do two chapters in general, which is these are, it's sort of, it's the same character, it's one continuous timeline, there's not a lot to talk about in either chapter, um, and we also don't want to do six weeks in the circus with Matt. We'd rather do three weeks in the circus with Matt. So we're doing a couple of doubles. Also, we're kind of massaging the episode numbers so that episode 500 is a uh, exciting chapter. Because <laughs> that's the that's main a reason. Big job Everything the reason. else has kind of fallen out after is like, oh yeah, this works out well because this would have this would have been grueling. It's just as we go through them, you know, we combine episodes and we, we looked... We looked at what was a reasonable episode to combine, and then how, what episode would that make episode 500 fall on, and we looked at a couple of different plans, and this is the one that, that worked on a couple of different levels. So, um, it's not just one reason, as with anything, uh, but also, <laughs> the second chapter, man, has got to be, I don't know, it, it's just like one of my least favorite chapters. A hell in Matterin. A hell in Matterin. It's just like, it's... It's two on character building, but I don't feel like it ever matters. It's weirdly Sanderson esque. Mm hmm. It like it's so odd when you when you've read the books a couple of times through and you get a feel for Brandon versus Jordan. Like Brandon Sanderson versus Robert Jordan, a, you can tell there's a difference, and yet over time rereading them, it almost feels like there's this foreshadowing of Sanderson's style in parts <laughs> of Knife of Dreams. There's parts that feel like what Sanderson picked up on and ran with without changing. Which then makes me wonder how much of the Sanderson writing we take on in the last three books is actually stuff that Jordan wrote, because we know he wrote a lot of scenes. Which would be the, the um, time goes in one direction Occam's razor explanation is that we've been attributing too much of what we don't like to Sanderson just because he's a convenient scapegoat to pile everything we don't like on yes it, it, I'm going to venerate the man Robert Jordan who created and perfected the wheel of time in a way that I don't think I will Brandon Sanderson <laughs> I'll, just I, at this moment right Jordan's dead Right. Then right. his legacy exists, right? And it exists as this static thing. Whereas Sanderson is still a di very dynamic person. Yeah, he's he's constantly doing stuff, upsetting industries, producing books that people didn't know about while producing books that people did know about. Like he's a whole he's a whole thing. So yeah, I definitely get some of the so yeah, just some of some of the weird feelings about action scenes and Matt here remind me a lot of Sanderson. Yeah, and there's, you know, Sanderson really, in some ways, I think Sanderson's ending was the ending that Jordan could have never written, which was a fun battle. Right, yeah, 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 Jordan could not have written a small novella's worth of chapter to make the last battle, just of action scenes and battles, That that was not his way, not at all. I think we would have had a lot more flashbacks. I think we would have had a lot more metaphysical stuff. But I think the battle itself would have happened much quicker. I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. Man. All right. Anyway, enough of that. That's speculating on what could never be. What we are doing today is really getting into, aside from Matt and Tuan, is Matt and setting up for the rescue in the Tower of Genji. Yeah. Because that's the other thing that happens today mm -hmm. is the letter. The letter and the the agreement to go and, and the information about how the tower relates to the Finn and like all of that is is also coming together here. And yeah, so we're going to get that, which is really, really cool, even though the Matt and Tuans and Circus stuff is less exciting. The, oh, the, the letter. We get my dearest Tom. It's so great. All right, shall we, uh, re I'll, I guess I'll read us in. Yeah, yeah, read us in. A village in Shiota. And her symbol is the snakes and the foxes, which makes a whole lot of sense. So much sense. <laughs> um, just based on the letter, right? The following day brought a respite, or so it seemed. Tuan, in a blue silk riding dress and her wide tooled leather belt, not only rode beside him as the show rolled slowly north, she waggled her fingers at Seleucia when the woman tried to put her done between them. 
Seleucia had acquired her own mount, somehow, a compact gelding that could not match Pips or, I- or Iken, but still surprised the Dapple by a fair margin. The blue-eyed woman with a green headscarf beneath her cowl today fell in on Tuan's other side, and her face would have done an eye said eye proud when it came to giving nothing away. Matt could not help grinning. Let her hide frustration for a change. Lacking horses, the real Aes Sedai were confined to the wagon. Metwin was too far away on the driver's seat of the purple wagon to overhear what he said to Tuan. Only a few thin clouds remained in the sky from the night's rain, and all seemed right with the world. Even the dice bouncing in his head could steal nothing from that. Well, there were bad moments, but only moments. Early on, a flight of ravens winged overhead, a dozen or more big black birds. They flew swiftly, never deviating from their line, but he eyed them anyway until they dwindled to specks and vanished. Nothing to spoil the day there, not for him, at least. Maybe for someone further north. Did you see the omen in them toy? Tuan asked. She was graceful in the saddle as she was in everything else. He could not recall seeing her be awkward about anything. Most of the omens I know concerning ravens specifically have to do with them perching on someone's rooftop or cawing at dusk or dawn. All right, that's my best teeth clenched Michael Kramer, Kate Redding, Sean Chen. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. You're imitating their Sean Chen exactly specifically, and I can tell it so well because I know those books <laughs> better than I should. <laughs> Or I could just go with the, uh, the the canon. Did you see some omen in them, Toy? Most omens I know concerning ravens specifically have to do with them perching on someone's rooftop or calling at dawn or dusk. <laughs> oh, or Texan. Or Texan. Or, or well, Texan. That's, yeah. You can either do it the Michael Kramer, Kate Redding accent or the Texan. No, uh, Yeah, and, and, and I'm sure Texans will tell me that's more Southern than Texan, but you know. Doing my best here. As a far West Coast person, I cannot tell the difference. So yeah, they're cruising along and we get to talk about superstitions and omens and just, we've talked about this a little bit before, but we're reiterating the cultural differences between the lore that Matt knows, the lore that Tuan knows, and the belief system that Tuan has bought into that's built on top of what actual lore she does know. Because she does literally know lore. We get an actual lore drop here, but it's tangled up in, you know, all her other weird superstitious stuff. I I find it particularly frustrating for her to say, oh, ravens aren't the Dark One's eyes, when we know. I know. And it's like one of those things that's like, we know it for a fact, but at the same time, like, I get why that's a superstition. She thinks that's a superstition, right? Like... Because ravens are a critical symbol of the imperial right. throne. And, like, we we can't be intrinsically associated with being the eyes of the Dark One. That would be um incorrect. Right. As they see themselves. They don't see themselves as agents of the Dark One. Like No, they're the heroes that are going to fight the final, last battle and defeat the Dark One, right? The, the Dragon Reborn right. is going to kneel at her throne, and that's how they're going to fight the final battle, is with him as a servant of the Crystal Throne. Right. And, you know, as Chat's pointing out, like, it would be a very convenient seed for a Shamael to implant with the Shan Chan right there at the beginning to make them turn away from that very normal in-world lore. Right, and that's what, the other thing we have to remember is a lot of the Shan Chan prophecies have been influenced by the Dark One, by Ishamael, right? Because he planted the seed that sent them across the ocean and to return and, and brought them back. Right, and they have what we assume are altered versions of the prophecies of the dragon because they're very different from ours. The Shan Chen always say, oh, well, clearly the ones over here have been altered to erase all knowledge of the Crystal Throne, blah, blah, blah. Whereas we know, like, logically, no, yours were altered to insert the Crystal Throne. Who the hell did that? And I mean, it can't all be a Shamael. Like, the man is asleep for the vast majority of this time. He's just able to set seeds. People act in the centuries between and, and it's interesting that there's no you know shadow spawn on that continent either they were wiped out yeah it's they've had a very different relationship to icons and lore and practical lived experience with the dark than their parent continent has and then this is one of my favorite takes on the prophecies 
Do you believe that if you sleep on old Hobbs Hill under a full moon, the snakes will give you true answers to three questions, or that foxes steal people's skins and take nourishment for food so you can starve to death while eating your fill? Because of the stories told by Brigida about, like, you don't want to eat the food they give you. Obviously, the snakes are answering the three questions. The foxes, we've seen Matt talk about the skins they're wearing. Like, it's just, it's a really accurate Sean Chan prophecy talking about the snakes and the foxes. It's the fae. They're the fae. Robert Jordan is saying, yeah, you know, like, the creatures under the hill that have glamour instead of food and you can get answers from them if you can trick them into having the right bargain with you. Like, those are real creatures from our world. I mean, real. I mean, not yeah, real. Yeah, you know what, yeah. That's a real mythology. Right. Like, he's saying exactly the mythology Legends fade have to myth is still the mythology yeah. they have. Like, the fae are the fae are the fae are the fae are the fae. And I love that. But what's interesting about that is the fae are also the... Oh, what's another term for the... The term for the Fae, he turned into I should I. It's like, sh- I should I or something. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah, it's um, Gaelic. And it looks just like I should I, but you pronounce it a little differently with a Gaelic accent. And I don't know how to do that. But yeah. But essentially, that's another term for the fairy folk, right? So there's this, this conflagration of two different people that, oh, we have these snakes and foxes and we give them certain properties but they become associated with the Aes Sedai, who are the magic people. And that legend's combined to create a new legend, which is our fae folk. Our fairy folk. Yeah, no, Robert Jordan saw nothing wrong with splitting these things down to their atomic level constituents and recombining them. Like, that was that was how he got away with ruthless plagiarism that doesn't feel like plagiarism. You know? <laughs> and then in the next line, we find out... The eelfin are the snakes, and the eelfin are the foxes, right? Because up to this point in the books, it was never made clear. We talked about the snakes and the foxes. We talked about the eelfin and the eelfin. But it was never clear whether the snakes were the eelfin or the eelfin, right? Just in terms of terminology. So here, he actually lays it out a little bit. It's him being like, oh, by the way, the snakes giving true answers, which the Aelfin did after a fashion. Okay, now in lore we actually get to know for the first time that the uh, the snakes are Aelfin and the foxes are Aelfin. That's so funny. I never knew that there was an actual canonical passage that clearly laid it out. I've always just been like, this is ambiguous and someone worked it out. Like the fandom worked it out collectively, but it's completely ambiguous forever in the books. I, but th- th- This is a direct passage that just lays it out. That's nice. And, I, and then I immediately, of course, got it wrong, right? So, Aelfin, the A, right? The, the pronunciation is hard, because Aelfin, Aelfin, like, I may be sounding the same. Sure, sure. So, um, A as in apple are the snakes. E as in elephant are the foxes. Yeah, that, that information went right out of my head already. I, I will not be committing that to memory. The way I, The way I remember it, right? is we say snakes and foxes. Snakes is first, foxes is second. We say aelfin, which is the A, and then eelfin. That's both alphabetical order and the same order as snakes and foxes. The snakes come first, the foxes come second. Oh, okay. All right, cool. That's logical. But I agree, Vuji. I would think that eelfin should be the snakes because eels right. are shaped oh, like snakes. Yeah, no, don't remember that. That would be a much better than <laughs> That's wrong. But no, no. that's incorrect. <laughs> the best we can do is to remember that that is not how it mm-hmm. works. We don't say foxes and snakes. We say snakes and foxes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just remember that it's backwards, precisely. Um, I also like this old, uh, the old tongue, Kaysen Hob, is another name for the dark one. Kaysen just meaning old. Yeah. I was looking up any sort of relevance to that, and I couldn't find anything about any real-world connection on that. I just like the word. It makes me think of Kaiser, but that's a real big stretch. That's a real, real, real big stretch. But I kind of like it, given that Kaiser is a, a you know a version of Caesar, and it's just that's so old, and it's such an esteemed title, and it's just so impactful on the entire Western world that I'm like. If there's no other explanation, why not? 
I also like this next line in the last paragraph where he talks about how he's just, he's juggling six colored balls casually, and that feat had impressed the juggler he bought the balls from, and it was harder while riding. And I'm like, yes, six balls does impress a juggler, right? Like, in the first book, remember we talked about how he was juggling like 12 balls or something absolutely, like, uh, ridiculous and out of this world. Um, Or Tom was, anyway. But, like, yeah, six balls is very impressive for any juggler, right? Like, seven is world class. Yeah, I, I highlighted that thinking of you and your repeated rants about how Robert Jordan didn't understand juggling. And I'm wondering if Robert Jordan maybe was informed by more than one fan and person in his life that he was, in fact, wrong about juggling and may have decided to put this little acknowledgement of his uh learning in the book uh-huh. Uh-huh. I want to think that because it's a pretty big claim and I'd like to think that more than just you noticed that that, that was a problem throughout the course of his having a fandom career and I want this line to be a little like acknowledgement of that of being like yeah, I, I mm-hmm, want that mm-hmm. I think we can head I am. that I, am. I think that's a safe bet <laughs> that's for you that's specifically for you that, no I know I, I appreciate that Jordan put that in there for me specifically so yeah, they're just flirting, yeah. basically, yeah. for like a page. Oh, so, okay, this thing, such as that you could calm a fractious horse by biting his ear, right? Him being like, that's ridiculous. I looked it up. That is something people do. I think she does it later, or he sees her do it, or something like that. Like, it does come up at one point later, and I, I believe it because Robert Jordan made a point of having it work on page. But yeah, I thought, like, that seems real dumb. But also, it's like you could easily test if it doesn't work. Right. And she's supposed to be good with horses. So I'm like, she surely is speaking from experience. And I assume it's more of a gentle nibble rather than like, you're not like chomping sure, down sure. trying to like chew this horse's ear off. Right. Like I do it. Um, I'll do I do it to Timber sometimes or right? I'll be kissing his face. And then I just like, arr, 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 and I'll bite down. Sure, on yeah, his, yeah, yeah. He's got all this extra flesh bite. on his cheek. And I just give him a little little bite on the cheek, you know, and he goes, ah, oh, and puffs out his cheeks because he hates it. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, naturally, as naturally, one does. as one does. But it gets his attention in the same way that I think that's what she's basically saying is the horse gets distracted and what you want to do is get its attention. Sure. I mean, ears are very much, they're much like eyes because of the way that their sensory organs, if something happens to them, like it is really all you're going to think about at that moment because it is very much in your monitors, so to speak. Also, I mean, I have, there's these two horses that come by my property and graze sometimes and I see them like doing that thing where they stand against each other and sort of like scratch each other's necks. And sometimes they'll get up to each other's ears, too. And there's it's a biting kind of thing because they're using their teeth, right? Like, as a brush on each other. And, like, I mean, yeah, the ears definitely get involved when that sort of uh, self-mutual gro- uh, grooming is happening. So, yeah, it's like their ears being a thing that you can handle and direct attention with fits with horse behavior. That That works. But it does seem like a big stretch also. To like lean that far forward while a horse is being upset and like bite it. It might be that if you're on the ground, you might be yeah, reaching, I guess it would be easier. pulling the yeah. head down to you and biting it. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's like my parents' dogs will lick each other's ears for hours, right? Just grooming, sure, right? You know, sure. and I'm like, that's disgusting because it sounds absolutely horrible. Well, I mean, yeah. yes, misanthony. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of courting. Uh, and him being like, oh, surely she's not flirting with me. But when we know, she knows she's planning on marrying him because of prophecy. So he's like, I have no idea. She would never be planning to flirt with me. Like, there's no way she could think that I want to marry her. Meanwhile, she's like, okay, well, he's already said his half. Uh, so I have the power here. When he's also thinking that the concept of a marriage not based on love is, like, literally impossible. And it's like, she's a head of state. She's going to do a politically expedient marriage. Duh. He's like, well, she doesn't seem like she's falling in love. And it's like, yeah, she doesn't think she needs to fall in love in order to evaluate someone to marry them. Like, those things are completely separate in her mind. She just wants to play power games, right? That's what she's doing, which is the whole name thing that will, you know, where they're trying to, she's trying to be like, no, I'm going to call you a nickname and you're going to break first. Yeah. Yeah. And she is falling in love with him, but that's not the point. That's not why she's pursuing the relationship. She's pursuing the relationship for strategic purposes, and a love component is developing on the side. But he's very 
Right, that he needs her to fall in love with him because otherwise he has no leverage in the relationship. <laughs> oh, for sure, yeah. for sure. She doesn't think it's no. important. That doesn't mean it isn't important for like the larger plot, but she is not prioritizing that. So as they're traveling, they come across a village in the middle of no farms. Dun, dun, dun. This village that isn't supported by any of the surrounding infrastructure. Just plopped down in the middle like it's pulled out of the past or something. Very anachronistic, asynchronous, out of time and space. Doing a bit of the old wibble wobble, one might say. <laughs> So yeah, bubble of evil. I don't even know if we can call these bubbles of evil anymore. They're more just like the the corruption of the pattern, the fraying of the 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 lace of ages, right? Like I think of it as the thinning of the veil, and it's not a bubble of evil. Bubbles of evil are like weevils leaping out of people and reality rippling. But the dead walking is a broad emergent phenomena basically as the overall th- fabric of reality is getting thin and this is a real big hole compared to a person walking down a hallway for a few steps a village existing for like an hour and sucking a living being down with them is a very different scale but i feel like it's still that rather than a bubble of evil but it does still have the acute time delay aspect of a bubble of evil so like also maybe much like time and space get bendy towards the bore, maybe bubbles of evil and other evil things become more and more alike as we approach like the final warping of the last battle, maybe? I, I mean, I just think we have a warping of reality and the dead walking is... Uh, maybe it's like one giant bubble of evil affecting the whole pattern, right? Like... You get lots of like little bubbles and every now and then you get this one massive like mega bubble and like, yeah, because this it feels like a bubble of evil, but of the mechanism of the dead walking. But like we know that the dead walking don't hurt people, at least not until we're a little bit closer to the last battle. At this point, ghosts haven't hurt anybody. This hurts somebody. So it makes it a little bit harder to say. This isn't just the dead walking. This is a whole pocket of the past existing and then leaving with residue from the present moment inside it, aka a person. I mean, honestly, the more I the more I look at this, the more I go back to the um, the bail what we used to call the bail scream that triple ripple, and the if that was really the breaking of the seals, right? And then you would have this no ah. separation. The bore would be open, right? You would have this crossing of the veil and that's when the dead would start walking when all the seals were broken well and even if the dead were walking before this is maybe when the dead gain the power to harm right and they they all level up when we go from a flicker to a roar no i think i think you're right if we're imagining that those breakages could have been the seals then expecting everything to get more intense after totally tracks yeah 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 it feels more like a bubble of evil it really does But then again, I mean, like when the buildings start shifting, is that a bubble of evil or is that something like the ghosts, right? Like, right. Well, yeah, that again, that feels like the the pattern itself is fraying right around this event of, well, maybe that is an effect of the bale fire being used, right? Or maybe that is the dark one breaking out or, you know, it just it feels like for the dark one to be touching the world this much. There should be fewer than like it feels like there should be a difference between four seals being broken and then these last three Mm -hmm. and i know the seals only get broken in the last battle right we're not i'm I'm just saying that like it it feels like robert jordan may have planned to have broken them in this book during during the bale scream yeah at at this point i mean we're kind of just trying to parallel engineer what robert jordan might have been thinking and then ultimately decided not to make true because he left himself that option. But we're trying to reverse engineer an alternate explanation for sure. what's actually happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no. It's it's not necessarily that Jordan had made up his mind at this point, right? I think that's he's leaving himself options. Yeah. And because we never really got a satisfying answer as to what the bail scream event was, you know, we're just speculating as to what it could be and how it could affect this part of the story, right? Yeah. 
But yeah, I've honestly I've talked myself into thinking that this is a bubble of evil. I've talked myself into it. This is not just the dead walking. This is a bubble of evil that took the dead walking to eleven. Okay. I I think this is something that's just going to happen more and more frequently around the world as the last battle gets closer. As bubble of evils are. <laughs> right, as bubble of evils are, right? Like, it's just like, what? how do you want to define these things, right? Like, yeah. They're, they're an, a, an effect the Dark One is having on the pattern. Yes. Yes, that, that much is very, very clear. This would not happen naturally. No. No, really? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Real scientific conclusion we've arrived at here. And so then what follows is honestly one of the most horrifying events in the series this guy getting sucked down him calling for help the horse getting sucked down with him matt Six screaming horses. they're dead keep going like all of these events in a row you know you know i listen to the audiobooks a lot and whenever i get to this scene no matter what i'm doing i am shocked back into listening to this scene it is very mm -hmm. horrific yep and and Michael Kramer gives it the gravity that it needs. Like he can hear that he had to back up from the mic so that way he could like, like yell yeah. project to the sound <laughs> properly. Like cause yeah, he, he screams for help, you know? It's cause he yeah, like six horses and this man going fucking hysterically like so loud he's louder than the horses and all Matt could think of is his bow being done. Like, I just, yeah, like, this is a level of horror on par with, like, Winter Night or the Attack in the Stone of Tear, where you're just like, I didn't know these books were going to give me nightmares. All of a sudden, like, we're having a happy la-di-da trip through the Shire, swords and dragons and magic boom-booms, and all of a sudden, just this page and a half of watching a train wreck <laughs> in slow motion. It's... Ooh, it's a lot. It's um, really good writing. Really good writing where he just slips in these little horror vignettes into a book that me, a person who historically does not read horror, suddenly is like reading. Um, and also, hey, fuck them, I said I for not helping, right? Like, they just watched. I'm so confused about why they didn't try to pull him out. I can only imagine shock. It just happened relatively quickly, and maybe they're far enough away, I, uh, you know, bystander effect? I don't buy bystander effect because they know their eyes to die, and eyes to die are constantly acting before anyone else has a chance to react. I also don't buy that it was too slow because Matt had a chance to yell, and he had a chance to push his horse forward and get pulled back by Tuan and yeah, Sarusha. Yeah, yeah. And that's plenty of time for everyone else to decide if they have something to do. The only thing I can think is that all three of them made the made the same conclusion that they would probably get sucked in if they tried to touch it, which is a bit of a stretch. But like we did see that work in Teller and Riyadh when there was that nightmare and we saw Aes Sedai channel and they got sucked in. These are not that group of eyes to die. They do not have that experience. It's a huge stretch to think that they all made the same conclusion. But it is possible that each of them to herself thought, if I reach out with the power, will that attach me to this man's fate? And I can't risk that slash I won't risk that. I, I find it surprising that three of them would conclude that at the same time and none of them would take the gamble and be like, no, 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 it's fine. The only thing, other thing I can think is that maybe they were in the wagon. I know it says they like hurried up to the the hat here, but it's I'm, I'm wondering if maybe they ran up to the hat after they they like got out of the wagon, so they didn't see the event. They were in the wagon. He did mention that they don't have horses, and so they have to ride in the wagon. So yeah, it could have been that they were in the wagon working on a lesson or whatever it stopped and they didn't really notice that they just figured it was a normal thing because you know they're pulling in for the night you stop and start and it wasn't until they heard screaming that they were like what's going on and then yeah by the time they got out and saw everything the man was like most of the way gone i could buy that that it, it was just an unfortunate instance of them being focused on something else you know because this is after the peddler's dead or gone right Everyone talked fearfully to be heard over the bars. Everyone except the three Aes Sedai. They glided hurriedly up the road, yielded by uh, Blarick and Fen by their expressions. You may have thought the village sinking into the ground were as common as house cats. 
you know, did they see it? Did they not see it? It doesn't really specify because it doesn't show their reaction to them seeing it. It's only them hurrying up the road to the hat after the event. Yeah. Yeah, I just, yeah, I have a hard time buying that they sat there and did nothing deliberately, but I could totally buy that by the time they were able to see what was happening, it was too late because they were a couple of wagons back and indoors and because it did it did just take a few seconds like it only takes a few seconds to react but those few seconds to come out the door and run around and see what it is plus your eyes to die so you don't run no right your eyes to die test is all about responding slowly and deliberately even when people are dying so like again by the time they could see what was happening like it was more or less over and they still hurry up the road to check it out but like that's kind of like the yeah we meant to do that because the way that they're calm as fuck means that they are super unnerved. Uh-huh. Because they're re- reverting to training. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They weren't able to do anything, so they and they don't know what to do, so they have to pretend that they know what they're doing as hard as they can. Their lack of ability to act means that they have to show themselves doing something. Because they should have saved him, but, you know, being that, you know, three seconds late made all the difference or whatever. Kind of like when they failed to save Manetherin, and they just pretended that they never tried. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the same instinct, just with a different result in practice. Or like Makir. So the next couple of pages is about trying to cross that section. And, you know, Luca stirs them all up and gets them going. Uh, Matt makes a bet with Tom. I, I didn't have a lot to say about that. No, it's just the only real things I had to say about it were... Um... Yeah, just the, the, the bet, really, between Matt and Tom, where they gamble on if Luca is going to be able to turn this hysterical mob around into being able to cross this stretch of road. And their, the way that they both approach reading people and reading crowds and Tom being right. I think that's the only thing that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Tom being right. There is one sentence here where Tuan's talking about, I would like to see these cities. Will you show them to me, Toy? And he says, uh, Lugard, maybe. From there, I can find a way to send you back to Abu Dar. We shall see what we shall see, to one replied cryptically, then begin exchanging finger wrinkles with Seleucia. And he's like, oh, they're talking about me on my back. I think that's her basically saying, look, he is going to fulfill the prophecy to let me go. And when he does, that's the time to marry him. Because he's going to let me go at one of these cities. If he fulfills that promise, this is the man of the prophecy. Hmm... I was wondering what that was about, but I like that. That also explains why she decides to get in like a fun getaway date. Yep. Because she's like, all right, we, I, I see the deadline. I see the clock ticking down. I know how long I have. So I, now, that I, now that I'm just waiting on him to do that one last little thing, let's go have some fun. I want to have some fun with you before I have to leave. Because remember, what, when she marries him is when he commits to giving her back to um, the Death Watch guard and yes. and letting her go. And then she tells him the prophecy and one of those, pro- the final line of the prophecy that he hadn't fulfilled is he will let you go. Yeah, yeah. But when her trusted bodyguards show up and say, we want to take you back and Matt says, thank goodness. <laughs> she goes, all right, he is my husband. Um, but yeah, so basically Luca shows why he is the leader. We've really only seen him being useless and annoying and in everyone's way. But now we're actually seeing him showcase his leader skills and leads everyone in a mad dash run across this scary, scary meadow. <laughs> um, and then I like Tom's line when he actually wins that bet with Matt, right? Because because Luca actually gets them to cross the meadow. And so he goes, I'm going to keep this as a memento to remind me that even the luckiest man in the world can lose. But of course, it's not a loss because that's the right outcome for Matt, right? He needs them to cross. Right. Taviran is making him, his wager is against what he needs to happen. That's how he can lose, is when he bets against himself, essentially. Right. And we see that in the next chapter, in A Hell and Matterin, he loses and considers that to be one of the luckiest throws he ever made because that's the outcome he needs. Right. It's not a straight ahead, mindless luck. It's a what's best for you kind of luck. And that's, I think there's a line where he says, I figured out how to lose a while ago. And I think that's what he's talking about is like, I can, I can lose when it's better for me to lose. Exactly. It's, it's not, <laughs> it's not simple. It's complicated. <laughs> it, it's Taviran. Okay. It's not just a card trick or a circus trick. It's, it's Taviran. So yeah, Matt goes to try af- after they 
park for the night, Matt like tries to go and pretend everything's normal with Tuan and Solution. And they're like, no, tonight's a night for like prayer and contemplation because we saw some really fucked up shit and the end of the world is coming and we just need like a night to process that and he's like all right fair enough i'm gonna go eat drink and make merry with all my friends yeah i was gonna say if you mean if by prayer and contemplation you mean drink until you can't see straight then yes well everyone needs to respond in their own way you can't just (laughs) pretend it was a normal day and have a normal evening like you got to do something to mark the fact that today was fucked up whether that's drinking or praying or whatever, like something must be done. Or, you know, initiating going on an epic quest to save a, a wizard from the fairies. I, I love him telling uh, Nerum and Lopin to get drunk. And I love, come along, Nerum. Lord Matt <laughs> wants us to get drunk and you're getting drunk with me. I have to sit on you and pour brandy down your throat. I love that interaction. Yeah, that's one of my favorites between them. It's like, oh, yeah, that really rounds them out. Those are the sort of side character interactions that I love that Robert Jordan does. It rounds out those characters and makes makes Lopin and Nira much more human to me. It also makes me ship them a little bit. <laughs> okay, I've never done that, but uh, I'll tell <laughs> They're going to go have some trauma bonding uh, over alcohol. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, they have a lot of feelings they need to get out. But just Lord Matt wants us to get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> is it the sitting on the chest? Is that really what 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 brings up the the shipping there? And have to pour it down your throat. Uh-huh. That's just such a very specific image. <laughs> 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 I have got shipper brainworms. Okay, uh... I know the wrong people. I mean the right people. I know all the right people, and now I have shipper brainworms. The fandom has a dirty, dirty mind. Together, one single dirty mind. <laughs> We have one brain cell collectively, and we use it for absolute <laughs> filth. <laughs> Speaking of spanking. Uh... So the uh, at night, the dice are louder than ever in his head, but this is just like the single last dice that are going in his head, right? From the original four. Yep, yep. He's down to one set of dice that desperately want to land. All right, so he, he's playing games with a bunch of people we've got julian and amathera and oliver and noel tom's there doman and egion doman and lylewin fuck you matt for still calling her egion and doman and lylewin come in and they basically make nice with julian and amathera egion and lylewin lylewin goes to start helping amathera like deprogram herself and have a little more self-confidence i feel like we're gonna get some hero worship from amathera for the next couple of years that's gonna probably be a dynamic Um, right they basically make nice and then are like hey do you want to go like hang out elsewhere and drink because lylewin had essentially said that amathera was you know property and julian had freed property and therefore he was a thief so like she called him a thief which i'm um, just like you want to piss julian off the thief taker thief catcher i don't know which one is correct i'm sorry julian you want to piss him off call him a thief right and calling his you know now i think they're married right wife yeah they're married now yeah you know property also right like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so she's trying to make up for that and there's a lot of good stuff here where she's like, I'm growing as a person. Are you going to let me do that? Like, I'm coming from this culture. And and we should really talk about, like, how much this was supposed to be the template for Tuan. Uh, yes. Um, And how this realization and change and evolution and disavowing things you've said in the past is so important for Egyanin and should have been how Tuan was written in the final three books. And also like how important it is, I think in our modern world to really be like, listen, if people are actively changing and if they've said some horrific things in the past, but they are apologizing and saying the right things now, we need to give them some space to do that. Yeah. You have to give people grace and space to grow if there's an honest effort being made. And yeah, Lyowen is like, yeah, so I'm naked and alone in a brave new world uh, trying to figure this out. And then also Domon gets to break the ice a little bit with his whole like, and I'm also not a smuggler anymore. <laughs> yeah. so you don't have to hate me. I'm, I'm not breaking the law. Just by the way. Stormlight Archive, Dalinar has a great line that's sort of similar where he says, uh, sometimes a hypocrite is just a man in the process of changing. That 
I like I like that because yeah, oftentimes I find the things that I have the strongest opinions on are the things that I'm working through. So, you know, I tend to run my mouth on stuff that I'm actively thinking about. And <laughs> that's the stuff I'm most likely to change my mind on because uh-huh. I'm actively thinking about it. You know, right. you don't tend to change your mind on stuff that you aren't currently churning on. And you're not going to talk about stuff that you aren't currently churning on because, like, that's how my mind works. So, yeah, I oof, that that line hits me on a personal level. I don't normally go for, like, Sanderson aphorisms, but that one that one will make the cut he's got some good lines i i will say that like you you know he's really he's written into his books some really powerful prose but you know you write enough words <laughs> some of them sure better. sure but no he, he really he's written um he's written some good lines right like uh what's well, one of my favorites is i will protect those i hate even if the one i hate the most is myself Okay, well, don't fucking attack me personally. Like that. <laughs> just uh, at me next time, God. No, this this some real like I you know because because in, especially in Stormlight Archive, right? He's basically dealing with characters who have mental illnesses, right? They have cracks in their personality, and that's how the magic gets into them, right? Like the, he's l- little literally written a magic system that you have to be like neurodivergent in order to like do magic. Right, you have to be fucked up in the head in some way, or have suffered from trauma, or okay. yeah. Being neurodivergent is not the same thing as being traumatized. No, but he, okay, fair enough. Well, <laughs> but in a lot of ways, the trauma comes from being a neurodivergent. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just saying. Right. <laughs> trauma does not cause autism. Uh, no, it's the other way around. Autism, yeah, exactly. co- autism exactly. plus our society causes trauma. Yes, um, yes. And and but so basically, yeah, that's that's. Uh, I, I forgot my point. Uh, Sanderson occasionally has banger lines. Banger lines. And also, they're all, uh, very much can be applicable to those of us who um, don't fit in, right? I think that's... He's writing to that audience, specifically. Yes. As as most authors are. <laughs> yeah. Well, because if you sit and you read big-ass books all day, you're not normal. You don't fit in as a kid, right? As most authors who we like are. Yes, yes. Suppose there are authors who are not catering to us, and we don't like them because they're not catering to us, so we don't know who they are. You don't love Tom Clancy? I am aware that he exists, and I'm pretty sure my grandma likes reading him. Where are we? So Lylewen and Domon take Julian and Amathera back to their tent. And it immediately starts raining as they leave. And again, because I have shipper brain rot, I'm just like, is this their meat cute? Are the four of them going to become a thing? <laughs> because they're all like running through the rain and then they like laughing and then they drink their wine. And like then, you know, like they have a friendship and then maybe at some point in a couple of years, you know, you know, or maybe in just a couple of months because it's the end of the world. I don't know. I have shipper brain worms. Sorry, you guys. It's just it's just what it is. But I, I'd like to imagine that. No, I'm just picturing uh, Bell Domon wearing Julian's hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I mean... And nothing else. <laughs> Whoa. That is, that is a well-set-up man in some people's minds. <laughs> and nothing else. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> Bell Domon and Jul- Someone make this art. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> You're ridiculous. Noel takes up a story about Atha on Mir and almost makes it raunchy before remembering that there is a 10 year old in the room. Right. And then like skillfully swerves away from that. And that's a really nice backdrop to Matt being like, hey, Tom, you want to play a game? Tom's like, nah, I'm I'm busy thinking about things. And Matt's like, what's with the letter? And Tom goes, fucking finally. Along with all of us. Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, my God. Because, like, we have wanted to know about this letter, right? We've known that this letter came from Moraine. We've known everything Matt knows. And we're like, clearly we're supposed to know what's in it. Clearly we're supposed to know. And, oh, my God, finally, finally, finally. 
So, okay. What's the published date between Lord of Chaos and Knife of Dreams? Knife of Dreams was 2005. Lord of Chaos was 94. So there were 11 years in real time Damn. between when we found out that the letter existed and when Matt asks about the letter. So for those of us who were following along and reading in real time, and I was at that point, because I, I think Lord of Chaos was the last book that was out when I finished reading. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, 11 years. That's almost Game of Thrones level of frustration. Wow. Now, in world time, I had I actually looked this up and I was like doing the math. It's slightly over four months. Wow. Only four months? Four months since, basically since the end of Lord of Chaos. It's been about four months. Wow. God damn. That's impressive. 11 years in reader time and four months in book time. That's wild. Basically, if you take the time, uh, and I, I know we've talked about this many times, but if you look at Eye of the World and The Great Hunt, the amount of time those two books took, the next four books through Lord of Chaos, and really, if you want to add on, through A Crown of Swords, right, take about the same amount of time as the first two books. And then all the rest of the books combined take about that same amount of time again. Right. And that's another, you know, half the series. <laughs> so it's two books, then four books, then like seven, eight books, right, to cover the same amount of time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's redonkulous. But yeah, and uh, but yeah, we we've we've had about 4 months since the end of Lord of Chaos in 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 the books at this point. Right. And this was the first book I waited on mm, of the series. Mm -hmm. Not, this was the first one where I got to the end of a book and reached for the next one and was greeted with coming out in. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, we haven't gotten to the letter yet. Like, how? how? Right. And so when this book came out, I got my very first experience of the satisfaction of getting a new book. And then the fucking letter was in it. I was over the moon. Did you do any speculative internet searching before this book came out? No. Hmm. Okay. No, this was long before I ever made my first... Uh, tentative foray into fandom that never went anywhere this was, that was before <laughs> even that yeah yeah and then you know there's of course you know, i'll put the link in the episode description of course there is the promo for towers of midnight which is this letter being read and put with a cool video and that like was the promo for towers of midnight which was pretty cool because it let us know that you know it's gonna happen it's gonna happen in this book the rescue, that is. Can I just say, I love he, he, this line when Matt asks about the letter. If you don't ask him, Tom, why did you read that letter the way you do? Oliver yelped with glee at the good toss of the dice. Aha! <laughs> aha! Aha! The Oliver Matt dice uh, for snakes and foxes connection. Yes! Yes, right? And that, the fact that that connection is held all the way through his adventure and that Oliver wins a game of snakes and foxes at the exact same moment that Matt breaks free and rescues her and wins the game of snakes and foxes. Like, I love that that connection is established here and then carried over in two books later into the actual game. Oh, that's a very good catch. I had not quite noticed that, but you're, you're so right. You're so right. At this point, the connection has been forged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, uh, would you read the whole letter? Yeah, I was gonna say, do you want me to? You want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I will do that. My dearest Tom, there are many words I would like to write to you, words from my heart, but I have put this off because I knew that I must, and now there is little time. There are many things I cannot tell you, lest I bring disaster. But what I can, I will. Heed carefully what I say. In a short while, I will go down to the docks, and there I will confront Lanfear. How can I know that? That secret belongs to others. Suffice it that I know, and let that foreknowledge stand as proof for the rest of what I say. When you receive this, you will be told that I am dead. All will believe that. I am not dead, and it may be that I shall live to my appointed years. It may also be that you and Matt Cawthon and another, a man I do not know, will try to rescue me. May, I say, because it may be that you will not or cannot, or because Matt may refuse. 
He does not hold me in the affection you seem to, and he has his reasons, which he no doubt thinks are good. If you try, it must be only you and Matt and one other. More will mean death for all. Fewer will mean death for all. Even if you come only with Matt and one other, death also may come. I have seen you try and die, one or two or th all three. I have seen myself die in the attempt. I have seen all of us live and die as captives. Should you decide to make the attempt anyway, young Matt knows the way to find me. Yet you must not show him this letter until he asks about it. That is of the utmost importance. He must know nothing that is in this letter until he asks. Events must play out in certain ways, whatever the costs. If you see Lan again, tell him that all of this is for the best. His destiny follows a different path from mine. I wish him all happiness with Nynaeve. A final point. Remember what you know about the game of snakes and foxes. Remember and heed. It is time, and I must do what must be done. May the light illumine you and give you joy, my dearest Tom, whether or not we ever see one another again. Morin. So much good stuff in that letter. Oh, God, it was so satisfying to finally get that. I mean, like, this whole book is a satisfying set of payoffs. This letter is the ultimate encapsulation of that. And and also to get what feels like a little Moraine POV after we have been, like, deprived of it for such a long time. Oh, God. After, oh, yes. Yes, exactly. So I love the that secret belongs to others, right? The secret of how she knew she was going to confront Lanfear at the docks. We know that secret is the secret of becoming a wise one's apprentice. Yeah, it's the it's the ideal secret. It's the ideal secret of, uh, of specifically the wise one's secret, right? Of going through the because even the clan chiefs don't do that. Right. Yeah, that is a wise one specific ceremony. And that's the seeing lots of multiple overlapping histories. It was kind of flicker, 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 right? It's basically the same thing as flicker, flicker, flicker. Yeah, yeah. It gives you that, but around the pivotal moments of your life and the critical things that can and can't happen. And, but yes, they, they give every wise one's apprentice a flicker, flicker, which seems kind of cruel. Um, and then we hear about, you know, hey, there must only, you know. There must only be three. No more, no less. Three will be the magic number, right? Right. Not one. Not one, not two, but three. Five, sir. Wait, no, that's... Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the other way. I thought the one other... Uh, some people were speculating it could have been Oliver, right? This idea that like he has this magic knowledge, but I like it better that he's the one playing the game. Yeah, no, you don't take a child into that situation. No. That's irresponsible. Mm -hmm. That's not what Matt has been doing with all of this mm -hmm. whole time. He did not save him and give him the red, uh, the red, the band of the red hand as his uncles to take him to be eaten by fairies. We get the line that you must not show him this letter unless he asks about it. Like, there was that one time that he kind of asked about it, but that was before Tom had read the letter. Exactly, exactly. Because Tom probably sat on it for like a week before he even cracked the seal, you know? So, and then obviously the timing has to be right. Matt had uh, to be skilled enough and, and he has to have the fireworks. He has to have like all the things that are going to make this rescue possible didn't happen until now. And I'm sure Tom was just fretting because all he wants to do is get her out of there. Right, right. But also like the relationship with Noel is really important. Yes. Noel is critical to the success and he's not going to volunteer to go until his relationship with Matt and Tom, to a lesser extent, has developed to a certain point. Yes, Timber's here. If you hear the jingling of the collar, he's coming in and out. And I do my best to leave in dog noises. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone likes dog noises. Uh -huh. Unless it's like barking. But yeah. Well, what's been happening is now that we're recording earlier, uh, Never likes to take him to the office in the morning and then she usually comes home for lunch about the time we start recording. So he's gotten home and he's all hyped up from being in the office and getting attention from everybody. And sometimes he collapses because he's tired, but sometimes he's still just up and about and enjoying himself. He's a good puppy. He's a good boy. Uh, I like that she says, oh, Lan and Moraine or Lan and Nynaeve are going to end up together. Uh huh. Uh -huh. He's like, <laughs> yeah, she's like, yeah, that that's happening. And that's I'm happening. super happy for them. Yeah, go, go enjoy yourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then remember to cheat, right, at the game of foxes. And not just cheat, but remember which rules you are breaking. 
right? You, these aren't just any old rules you're breaking. You have to break very specific rules to make this work. And then my dearest Tom, both at the beginning and ending of the letter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who are like, their relationship came out of nowhere, I'm like, it did, but that's because they communicate on a level that you didn't see. It harkens back to their encounters in, like, chapter five of book one. Mm-hmm. Like Chapter seven, Gleeman. I will yeah, always remember yeah, yeah, that yeah. chapter because I, like, that l- literally is the first time when I said, you know what? This podcast is on to something. Mm. We are, it's more than just two guys enjoying a book of series. There's actually a depth to these books that we are discovering and talking about that I have never found before. And I think in particular, it was the conversation between Moraine and Tom when we were looking at like, wait, who are these people? What will their relationship have been to each other? Would they have known the other one? Oh, and if they do, then they're talking on this whole other level that we just have never even seen before. Oh, and by the way, part of that is flirting. You know, I think that that might have been the episode that made me like feel committed to the podcast. Now I'm thinking about it. Like I was like, I mean, obviously I was into the podcast because Wheel of Time, holy shit. But I feel like I also remember like that discussion specifically when you guys decided to ask, wait, did they have any idea who each other were based on visual cues because of who they are? That conversation was like, I feel like that was either the conversation or one of the conversations that made me go like, oh, this podcast is for me. These are my people. Because she's wearing full Kyrian and royalty dress, which of course Tom knows what that is. And then he can narrow it down to who she is. And he was in um, uh, Andorra nobility at the same time that she would have been popular. They're the right age. Like all it's like, yeah, of course he knows who she is from her fucking dress, even if he's never seen her before. And she certainly says something about, you know, oh, a certain, you know, just a Gleeman, which makes us go, oh, of course, she knows who he is by reputation, if not by uh, sight. And then the whole rest that changes everything else about the conversation they have. Yeah, everything else. It changes everything. And like, is it the most well-constructed romance that felt like it actually earned where it landed? No, but like having that revelation so early on it's like no i mean robert jordan knew what his end game was for sure he very much knew who these people were and what they were saying to each other in a way that the rest of us couldn't pick up on until the end of the series was written (laughs) right 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 and then what we get is i think one of these cool i almost want to call it the heist movie setup right where all these people have knowledge that they've all had the whole time but until they sit down and talk about it it's like oh wait we do know the entrance how to get in where the entrance is like and and this we have the skills and the knowledge to actually pull this off even though it seems impossible normally yeah and it's it's satisfying too because again you know we as the audience have been gathering this knowledge and rereading the books and tearing our hair out over the lack of communication and we finally <laughs> get this payoff of right. characters like pooling their information and creating a synthesis all in one conversation it's just so beautiful this is the meme the wheel of time the wheel of which is a big stack of books and the wheel of time would be if the characters communicated tiny little stack of books because this would happen yeah. This yeah. could have happened ages ago. Ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they threw a combination of Matt's memories and just letting Oliver into the conversation with all of the bedtime stories Birgitta told him. Like Oliver is 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 like a he's not a demigod, but he is touched by the gods. He <laughs> he can never live a normal life because he got told bedtime stories by Birgitta and helped send Matt off to a confrontation with the fae that allows him to win the game of snakes and foxes and then he blows the horn so that way his friend noel comes back for him like this child cannot live a normal life i i don't think there's any doubt that he's a little severe in in my head absolutely yeah he he's a potential hero or some hero we haven't met before he's he's touched he's something extra he is going to enter a pantheon of stories because of the life he lives I do think it would be actually kind of funny to set him up for all this and just have him, like, die in his first real battle with a random arrow. <sighs> <laughs> like, I mean, you know, not not just 
set up a story and have him just like set up a, another like in in I don't know. I think it'd be a funny way to go as an author, but you know, cruel, obviously. There was a side character in a TV show I was watching that seemed like he was going to have a big old growth arc and join the main cast, and then he totally got sniped by a random arrow right as he decided he wanted to join the gang, and it was like, well. That was a fun half season arc of thinking <laughs> that that was a character I was going to care about, but I guess not. Never mind. Uh, since I'm talking about Stormlight Archive here, I'll I'll bring up Elokar, who was the you know, he was a weak king who was basically converting and about to become a hero, and just he was about to say his oath. Someone, st- uh, someone, fuck Moash, uh, struck him down, uh-huh. and you're like, oh, that he was going to have an arc, and now he's just not. That's he's he's dead. Okay. <laughs> so very similar sort of vibe yeah, there yeah yeah i'm not a huge fan of that i have a hard time remembering characters so if you're gonna get me invested in them and then mm-hmm. kill them off like i'm gonna i'm gonna get annoyed pretty quickly i have very low tolerance for that fortunately this is really the only he, he, brandon doesn't use it that often as a way of shocking you this was like definitely the one time he's used it in that series so far so i'm like okay once it's a warning but I'll keep reading. Right, yeah. Ruins of Ombre was tough over on Hot Nuance because uh, like half that cast didn't make it to the end of the book. I swear so many people died. But uh, at least they weren't adding new people. It was just the original cast, just like there was a lot of death like as mm-hmm. we progressed mm-hmm. forward. But it wasn't like they were kept adding new people and asking me to like care about them and then killing them. It was just a lot of people didn't make it. They didn't Walking Dead it? I no. No. <laughs> oh, that show is Walking Dead. I I am not a fan of zombies generally, so I have never wanted to watch that show. So from Brigida we get that the Tower of Genjai is the entrance and how to and how to open the door with the bronze knife and making the symbol. From Noel, we get the description, which jogs loose a memory in Matt's head. So he then knows, oh, I saw it on Bail Doman's boat. Doman will clearly know where it is because he used to take his boat by there all the freaking time, even if I don't remember exactly where it is. So they've got a location, what it is, how to get in. Right. And they gain a lot more information when Matt goes and talks to Brigida and asks her about her trips inside. That's when we get the, here's how to cheat, here's which rules to break and how. We get all that lore from Brigida later. We don't get that now. For now, we're just getting the download from Via Alver about how to get in. And he shares all of his experiences with the Eelfin and the Eelfin with this group. So Tom and Julian and Oliver. No, just Tom and Noel and Oliver. Julian's gone. Oh, that's right. It's just these three. He lets Oliver stay and get this massive mega mm-hmm. Kira download again. This child will never live a normal life. No, <laughs> absolutely. He's listening to Matt, his adoptive dad, talk about interdimensional portals and answers and how he's going to go back to rescue Gandalf. And like, no, this child will never do anything less than hero shit. You know, he's just sitting there with his mouth just wide open the whole time. Like, on holy the floor. shit. Yeah. On the floor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Even, even Noel, right? Jane Noel first writer is himself is just yeah, like, holy yeah, yeah. shit. Like, there's a certain amount of Like, are we in shock. a story right mm-hmm, now? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I, I love it. And I, I, I do truly think that Oliver is, like, going to be, you know, someone who gets inducted onto the Heroes of the Horn just because he lives a life so ridiculous after... He's not even 10 hearing this story. He is about 10. And Matt's just like, yeah, I, you know, snakes and foxes. And what do you want to bet that the Horn comes back to him at some point in his life? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. He's going to be the weird old king living in the Welsh countryside with, like, the horn under his throne, you know? Like, for sure. Like, he he is King Arthur or something. He's got the Holy Grail, like, way up in the mountains somewhere. Yes, and Brigida visits him in real life. Yeah, so it's I I just love it. I love it. And, and Noel, that tops anything I ever did. Anything Jane ever did too. Yeah, you just said the same thing twice because you were you were yeah, Jane. Yeah. Like the amount of times, like he's just hammering it home. Uh-huh. Like Jane uh-huh. and Noel are the same person. Yep. yep. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I know, I know Jane Farstrader inside and out in a way that nobody <laughs> else does because he was my cousin, and cousins tell each other everything, every deep dark secret of their heart, every failed mistake and mission. Like, sir, 
that's not how cousins work. You know, um, one thing we do know about Robert Jordan, though, is his good cousin slash brother, right? Oh, ha- yeah, yeah, yeah. Who That's passed true. away recently, unfortunately. Right, um, right, yeah. And, and we, we have an interview with him, I think episode 50, if you want to go back and listen to that. And in a lot of ways, that yeah, I can see there's a little bit of Matt and a little bit of Jane Farstrider. I would bet both characters are at least um, somewhat based uh, upon... I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name Wilson. right now, but Wilson. That, thank you. Yeah, based upon Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I could see that. And yeah, I mean, like so, some cousins are, yes, very, very close, more like siblings than like cousins. But uh, yeah, Noel is not doing a great job of convincing me of his alibi. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, Jane Forrest Rider. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, then Matt has to stare down Tom, who says, I will go whether or not you go with me. And Moraine says, that if you don't go with me, that means I will die. And so will Moraine. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's Tom that Matt goes to yeah. save. That's, right, right, That's right. the reason Matt goes is because Tom says, I will die unless you help me do this, in which case I might not die. It makes you wonder how much Tom sticking with Matt was because of this letter over the last couple of books. Ooh. He doesn't like Matt for himself. He only likes him for his potential wife rescuing abilities. He's like, basically, I need Matt to ask about this letter. And to do that, I have to hang out with him and protect him and work with him. And I can't leave. I have Uh to be supportive. I have to be a friend. I have to. Oh, I think you're right. And I hate it. It's something we should have been talking about much more over this, like, why is Matt, or why is Tom hanging out with Matt? Why is he supporting him? What has he been doing in the background this whole time? He's just been fingering that letter. Yeah, because if he had any hope of getting Moraine out any other way, he would have been gone. He would have been gone. Or if he didn't have the letter, maybe he would have decided to go with Elaine, you know, make his way to Camelin instead but no he has to stay around matt because matt will never ask about the letter if it's not being flashed in his face every single day uh i think you're right because if tom didn't have a moraine to rescue why would he stay with matt when did tom and matt hook up when did they start traveling together because tom was with uh elaine for a while right that's and that's how he ended up with matt when the two camps were traveling side by side when the the rebel camp was traveling with is is that am i remembering that correctly yeah they all went together to ebu dar and then when the shan chan invaded they split up matt met up with tom because he went to saladar on rand's orders and tom was there remember rand was like hey go pick up elaine and then matt ended up getting attached to elaine's party to go down to ebu dar I mean, and yes, like Tom definitely has a lot of reasons to hang out with Matt, but just like all other things being equal, why stay with Matt if not for the letter? There's so many different young people he needs to help. Why Matt? Yeah, basically, since Matt gives Tom the letter, Tom is with Matt from then on out. And that's in, right, end of Lord of Chaos. Oh, right, because Rand sends the letter along with Matt. He's like, hey, I think I think Tom's there. Will you please deliver this letter? Right. Matt delivers it. Tom sits on it for however many days, opens it, and goes, oh, oh. And so then, yeah, makes sure that he is within letter-waving distance of Matt from then on out. Tom and Julian accompany Matt, Elaine, Nynaeve from Saladar to Ebu Dar, right? So he's with them in, in Saladar, follows them to Ebu Dar, and from then on, he stays in Ebu Dar. The girls, right, go through the gateway. They flee with the kin. He stays back in Ebu Dar with Matt. And now, and then they, until they flee, and he helps them flee into the circus, and that's where we are now. So yeah, he has 100% been with with Matt since Saladar, in order to try and rescue. God, he's been waiting so patiently. (laughs) And yeah, and so uh, Matt agrees to go rescue Moraine, and the final set of dice rattle and stop. And so we've had the four set of dice that have gone off in his head over the last three chapters, six chapters, well, five chapters five chapters yeah over the last two episodes yes (laughs) two and a half episodes yes yes yeah um yeah it's a very satisfying thing to have matt decide to go rescue moraine because you figured moraine was coming back you figure with a letter like this clearly it's going to succeed 
but it's really satisfying to see the hero stop fighting his necessary inclusion in the rescue party. It's very like, oh, yeah, we're going to do it. And then you get the letdown of not actually having the rescue take off for a while, like not this book kind of a while. But, you know, at least the the first domino has been flicked. Yeah, when I say there's not a lot to uh, talk about in an episode or in a chapter, I mean we there's less than two hours worth of content. <laughs> Th- that that is correct. That is what we consider a lot. Yes, and and also I do think this was the denser chapter. I think the yes. next chapter is is uh, less dense. So yeah, yeah, I think we're gonna get under two hours for these two chapters. No problem. Yeah. So with that, mm-hmm. switching to chapter eleven. Yeah, chapter 11, A Hell in uh, Matterin. And then this is the dice, because he uses his luck to gamble and lose on purpose. A dice game literally takes up the majority of the page time for the chapter. Sure. So yeah, we start next morning. We kind of just blur out into the night and then fade in next morning, like four hours later, I'm guessing. (laughs) Um, Everyone is very much ready to get up and go. The normally slow moving caravan is like, let's get the fuck out. We want to go the farther, the faster, the better. Like, let's just go. Let's go, 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 go. They're putting as much distance between themselves and the man who got sunk into the ancient city. Yeah. They're just, no one wants to hang around. What if it's spreading? Yeah. It's like a sinkhole. Like, what if there's more, more cavernous space under you and the ground isn't actually solid? You just want to get away from that. We'll ignore the fact that there's nowhere safe in the world anymore because the whole pattern is deteriorating. I mean, really what they should be doing is kicking Matt out since he's Taviran and stuff like that tends to happen around him specifically. (laughs) But even then, that's not enough. It's happening plenty of places without Taviran too. Yeah, I wonder if almost that's not the case anymore because it's so common that it's just like it doesn't matter if you're Taviran. There's no there's enough bubbles coming up that it doesn't matter if they're slightly attracted to you. I think those lines are crossing right about now. Probably it used to be safer away from Taviran and very like a week ago and a week from now, it will completely be the reverse. Like we're right in that, that gray zone. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, shit, shit is the, the veil is thinning rapidly at this point. If you ever watched like a slow-mo video of like bubbles popping or whatever, like we're at that last, very, very last stage before the membrane has completely snapped away and is gone. I, I feel like uh, after Veins of Gold, Rand becomes some like an island of stability, right? He becomes the thing that's stabilizing the pattern. He gets all the he's he, because right the more evil the Dark One gets, the more good he becomes because the dragon is balance. Do Matt and Perrin, Matt and Perrin start to get similar qualities around that point? Like the food doesn't spoil as much around them and stuff. Yeah, the food doesn't spoil as much around them. They are able to form armies and resist some effects of the Dark One. So I would assume that that means that there's less instances of bubbles of evil near them slash better responses to the bubbles that do come up. Because, yeah, the the dragon is one with the land and also with his friends from childhood. So they get to another village, and they're very happy to see that they respond like normal people. (laughs) Right. They look at you, so, you know, they're not dead because they can see you. And Matt says um, the dead paid no mind to the living, which reminded me of the Aiel ceremony when they send them off into Iridion, where they said, you know, the dead do not speak to the living, like Mm, in a deliberate mm -hmm. act of like covering their faces and shunning them and telling them you have to go. You you aren't alive again. You aren't real to us again until you come back. Matt's gambling and he's rolling. (laughs) He's getting. Yeah, I, I don't really get this whole scene. Right. So he's tossing a bunch of high numbers. Right. He's getting. He's tossing five dice, right? Your highest mm-hmm. roll is, what, a 30, right? Five yeah. times six. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's getting a bunch of high numbers, and then ten times in a row he gets five ones. And then he keeps he keeps rolling ones, right? And, like, that's one of those things where it could be good, it could be bad, and this happens a lot, right? Where it seems like maybe we're in balance of some kind. I don't really understand 
what it is about him rolling dice. What's the analogy here? What's going on? Like, I'm, I, I don't understand what we're being told. I think, and this is just a hypothesis I put together on this reread for this podcast, I think it's foreshadowing his date with Tuon, both the uncertainty of how it's going to go, like how he's going to respond to it, you know, if they get attacked by evil people, whatever, but also his final toss at the end is ones. That is the losing toss that makes ever makes the problem go away. It's that mm. he gets all ones. So I think it's foreshadowing that like you're in a rolling ones kind of space today and that's actually a good thing that's going to come in clutch for you. But that's only something I put together this time through cuz yeah, I always thought it was kind of like what is this? I I don't I'm not totally clear. And he does have plenty of good luck that is not rolling ones for the duration of the game before he wants that one unlucky toss. But yeah, I think there's just a lot of negotiation kind of, or like an, it's at, we're at an equilibrium point and things could go any number of directions. I'm not sure. Or he's like trying to figure out, okay, if if I gamble, what are my tosses going to be? And he just reproduces that, right? Or somehow, like somehow, he's practicing for the game that's coming. Somehow, he's he thinks he's just dicking around, but yeah, like Jordan put it in there for a reason, or it's just there so that way he's idly tossing dice when Solusha shows up, kind of like, you know, Solusha's the main character, then Matt's like the NPC just waiting for her to come by and like you know activate the encounter, and he's just sitting there rolling dice. It just it just has this measure of him testing his luck for the day, right? He's like, sure. how lucky am I today? Let me find out. What's my luck going to be? So how can I use that, right? This idea that, like, he's not Taviran. He has never seen any sign of Taviran, but he can use his luck, right? And in the same way that Ran learns to use his um, balancing force, the way Baron uses his wolf abilities and Taviran traveling, right? Not Taviran, Teleron Riyadh traveling. Yeah, I think, I mean, and this this whole encounter is very, like, confusing and lackluster and what was supposed to happen, I'm not sure. Like, the whole the whole bar chapter just feels very, eh. So I'm not surprised that him rolling foreshadowing dice at the beginning is like, eh. Yeah, fair. And you'll notice here again, Solusha is being supportive of Tuan courting Matt because she's willing to come play messenger to get Matt. Right. Like, we never see Solusha leave Tuan's side. We never see her do anything to help Matt, except she's poured wine for him, and she helped Tuan restrain him from going to help the peddler getting sucked into the ground. And now she's coming to get him for Tuan. Like, you can really see that Solusha is recognizing where the tide is pulling. Mm-hmm. And also, I think that the quality of him, like, he's he's winning her over. Yes. Yes. He is not a scoundrel who is going to damage Tuan. Um, so she demands to go to a hell, and he, they, you know, basically, he freaks out, and then conspires with Tom to take her to just, like, kind of a skeezy bar. Yeah, because she basically learned the word for, like, the worst kind of dive bar, and they take her to, like, a standard issue dive bar, mm -hmm. and even though she knows the word, she doesn't really know how to judge, and so it it passes muster with her. Yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting interaction if you enjoy reading their their courtship fighting, but it's nothing to get into into. No, I've got I got the you know, they go to a place called the White Ring, which is clearly you know, I was gonna say be all clever and be like, Oh, the White Ring is a woman's garter, but then he fucking says it in the chapter uh -huh. and just spells it uh -huh. out. So I'm like, Okay, well that's that's the only real clever thing I had to say about this whole uh chunk. He he's noticing her boobs more. She folds her arms and he's like, Wow, she actually has boobs. I didn't realize she had boobs. And it's like, I mean, great, excellent observation. Um, we get the little interaction about how peasants have never looked at her, so they wouldn't know her on site. And it's just like, Okay, Sean Shan, like, you think that's a good thing, weirdos? Uh Tom asks some questions to get some information about the local politics. It's fun to see Tom in action. Yeah, this is what he does in every nice. city, yep. you know, his choice of clothes, his choice of behavior, how he interprets questions, because he explains to Matt, well, I got this surface information and a second level information and this third level information. And it's like, oh, that's how Tom works. And that it, it's fun to see it. But yeah, that's it. 
Um, and the most important thing about that is that he's learned that, you know, the Shan Chan are not really being resisted. We've seen that a lot. We've talked about it a lot. Um, he's reaffirming, like, no, the Shan Chan are setting down very effective deep roots already. This is this is going to be a problem for reclaiming our land from the invaders. And I like how much Tuan just wants him to wants to see Matt get in a knife fight. That's why she takes him to a hell. She is just freewheeling on her little vacation before she has to, because she knows she has to go back soon to work, and she just wants to get him in trouble because it would be fun. And I'm just like, that is so irresponsible with your future husband. I mean, it's it's a well, but yeah, that's the thing is he needs to be able to survive a night fight in order to survive as a Sean Chan prince. That is true. That is true. She does need to see how he handles himself in a in a close quarters combat situation. Yep. That's very important to her. Yeah, there's lots of two on looking at everything with with interest, and so we get lots of descriptions of pros. That's uh two on and Solusha are arguing. That's sort of a through line that happens throughout the chapter. I was gonna say the dark friends help uh, Matt sell that this actually was a hell, right? Because he, he, he <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good like, point. The fact that the dark friend actually does get in a knife fight and gets attacked really does help sell his point. Oh yeah, that was totally a hell. Didn't you see that horrible knife fight? I almost died for you. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. when it was really just not had at nothing all. to do with the quality of the bar no, and everything no. to do with dark friends noticing Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> and the fact that right we've gotten the orders from all the way at the top that these men are to be killed right matt and perrin are to be killed by dark friends that is standing orders now yep yep and they walk into the bar and we get the the really funny bar song i i like how it rhymes it get it's just it's just character color but you know it's a song about this woman just having a different man for every time of day and day of the week it's fun i'm just gonna point out i met young jack who was pitching hay I'm just saying, Jack, first three letters of my last name, could totally be a nickname for me. That's... <laughs> so you're saying that you're pitching hay? Uh, <laughs> let's just say, uh, I won't say often, He made I made her sigh. <laughs> also, note in the song, uh, there's an andril. It's not androl, it's andril, but there's mm-hmm. Master Andril gets a morning, but he's very old. So I'm like, did androl get into her song somehow it's spelled different <laughs> but only by one letter <laughs> but yeah it's basically i love this because it's uh basically all the different situations in which she sleeps with different men yeah it's like half drinking counting song and uh-huh. half just like body drinking like i'm assuming that there's like a really simple melody to it and refrain kind of thing like right now jack gets an hour when the sky is clear and willie gets an hour when my father is not near it's the hail off with moral for he shows no fear and kellen comes at midday he's oh so bold lord brellen gets an evening when the night is cold master andrel gets a morning but he's very old what oh what is a poor girl to do my loves are so, are so many, many and the hours so, so few <laughs> i love that finishing line mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what oh what is a poor girl to do my loves are so many and the <laughs> hours are so few <laughs> i mean I'm like, girl, get yourself a bottle of lube. That's all I'm just... I'm yeah, just... Where's the magic Where's the magic wand? Where's that link for the red rod to wrong real? <laughs> this woman is a red rod to wrong real. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, get her just drunk enough to dance on the table and they get naked. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so Matt and Tom bet again on if Tuan will be too sheltered to recognize this for being not the worst quality of dive bar. And Matt loses again. That's twice now that he he's good at gambling with random stuff. He's not as good at people as Tom is. Tom has the lived, earned experience of knowing people. And that's different than guessing. There's no luck involved in that. Exactly. That's, yeah, the only way you ever bet against Matt is when it, when there's no luck involved. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing he's actually earned through his own mm-hmm. intelligence is horses. Right. <laughs> yeah, don't bet him against him in horses either, because that's, uh, yeah, he's just good at that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the the making a bet thing is like, well, just don't bet on random stuff and you'll be fine. And battles, yes, but you shouldn't bet on battles. That's just bad juju. Uh, so Tuan has her first taste of home-brewed ale, and she likes it, and she sips it, <laughs> and I just love the innocence. I love it so much. I, I, I imagine her like kind of slurping it very loudly, like tea. 
Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> like, uh, not yeah. quite sure what to do with like the foamy head. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Totally. <laughs> She's definitely got like a beer foam mustache and a bit of it is on, on her nose, you know, but like no one's going to point it out because it's too on. <laughs> I really, I'm totally imagining her just like do, going like for like the big old like tipping it back and then putting it down and just like all the foam on her face. Just like, this is good. She yells at Matt for putting his hat on the table. Yeah, which is a real superstition, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. I I'm, think so. I'm pretty sure that that's like an actual superstition from, I'm assuming it's very popular in the South. I thought it was just rude, right? Like, I was just like, you don't put your hat on the table. It's gross, right? I, I've never thought that hard about hats. People, especially in the South, people are sweating. So you got that uh, brim of sweat that's like soaking sure. in. Often it's a damp like brim and if you set that down on the table you're basically like wiping your sweat on the table that is gross yeah i i tend to wear hats more as sun blockers so yeah but i also hate hats and i only wear them when i absolutely have to so <laughs> and one thing that's very different about the south and the pacific northwest is the humidity level right and uh-huh, so when uh-huh. you sweat in the south it doesn't evaporate right it absorbs into whatever you're wearing up here it's dry enough that really even if you are sweating which you don't do as much because it's not as hot and it's not as humid, um, it is going to evaporate off and it's not necessarily, you're not going to have wet items sticking to your body. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that there is a superstition, of, or maybe I just imprinted on these books really hard, but I'm pretty sure that someone <laughs> somewhere in the real world is like, nah, hats on tables is bad. It's amazing how often I have to ask myself, is this real or is this something that's in the Wheel of Time books and you've just normalized it and you assume everybody has as well? Yeah. That's it's a real problem. It's a real problem. But yeah, it's it's funny. And they do their their symbol for warding off evil is like devil horns, like rock and roll. Yep. That that's the sign against evil is is rock and roll devil horns. <laughs> it's pretty pretty fun. Hmm. Pretty fun. That is pretty good. Just just two on throwing up the devil horns there every once in a while. Just rock <laughs> Yeah. Tuan mentions pink ribbons, which freaks him out a little bit. I do not like that. That felt like an unnecessary inclusion. Mm-hmm. Like that that Matt's trauma and issues with Tylan would be brought up by his future wife, where they both know Tylan's dead. Like that that Tylan talked about that with Tuan, and that Tuan would bring it up. Both are really. Mm. I'm just like. I don't know how good you're doing at making her respect you, Matt, if she thinks that threatening you with pink ribbons is the appropriate move. Yeah. It feels kind of red flaggy to me. You don't think it's coincidence? There's no way she could just be, like, trying to... Because she did see him wearing pink ribbons. He might be reading more into that, necessarily, than... She is a painfully observant person. So I I could buy that she picked it up through inference and observation rather than being told directly. I could buy that. And the fact that he's not wearing them anymore, right? There's an obvious, like, she may not have been told about them. She may have just observed. Because remember, she was watching him very intently for a long time because she knew, prophecy-wise, he was potentially going to be her husband long before he ever realized it, right? So she was watching him and all of his interactions. And, yeah, I mean... That being said, do I think she asked? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't... Did he actually wear pink ribbons out? She. Oh, yeah. Because I thought he burned all of them after getting uncomfortably fucked in them. But she clothed him, right? All his clothes, the clothing was missing. So for a long time, all of his clothing was decorated with pink ribbons by uh, Tylan. Yeah. I have a hard time imagining Tylan, like, talking about that stuff with this basically teenager but they also were really belittling to matt and i guess that's how kings talk about their mistresses to foreign ambassadors so why not but it seems like a pretty cruel thing to throw in the face of someone you're trying to woo so negative points to two on for that and then there's this line here where she goes, you could have smiled back at her toy. She's very pretty. You were so stone-faced, you probably frightened her. And that's his response to her mentioning pink ribbons, is his just completely dead-facing, absolute, like, emotional dead panning. And she noticed it. Oh, I thought that that was just him very deliberately not smiling at the maid when she brought their drinks, even though he gave her a penny and stuff. Mm-mm. That's him immediately after the mentioning of the pink ribbons Mm. and the maid arriving 
and then he he scowls at the maid. Why he would never scowl at a maid? Mm. Normally, yeah. Even with two on there, he might give her a smile that he thought was innocent, right? Well, it's it says that he, not that he gave her more than a glance, of course, because he's with his wife to be. So where does he where does he scowl? Uh, so she places the wine down in the next paragraph, and then in the paragraph after that, you could have smiled back at her toy. You were so stone-faced. Yeah, it was his lack of smiling at her, because when the maid came, she, like, he he says, I'm not smiling at her because I'm with my wife to be. I, I thought that that was him being, like, prudish, not him lingering i it, it it's tough because that event he's literally interrupted from having to respond about the pink ribbons by her yeah. arrival so yeah. it's one of those things where it's like yeah i mean he's not smiling at her but he's also like kind of fucking pissed off right now yeah it's not great and and i don't i question also like the degree to which tuan knows what kind of a knife she's twisting like does she know the full depths of how much Tylen was assaulting him? Or does she just know that there was something fucky going on there and it's a button she can push, but like be maybe a little more vague on the details? Like, because you know, Tuan's definitely not like she's not even kissed anybody yet, right? No, she's super inexperienced. She's very sheltered about what dive bars are supposed to look like. Like, she thinks she knows, like all teenagers do, but her actual lived experience is quite limited. Because she's read a lot and she's been in palaces. She's been told how to not die. You know, she's a survived assassination attempts. But does she actually know, like, all the things that happen behind closed doors between people that aren't doing political intrigue? I don't know. And then she kind of starts to drill him for his life story, which I think is very much like there's I feel like there's a moment where she really is like, OK, he's going to let me go. I need to learn about him. Right. She's like, you're well traveled. You're lucky. You've been called a gambler. Like she's really sort of interrogating him about who he is and what he's doing. Oh, yeah. She's definitely like, let's go on a date so I can ask you about your siblings. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> right. right, right, right. This is this is definitely first date vibes. Yeah. Like, no longer just, like, competing or this is, like, yeah, okay, we are officially courting. Yeah. Yeah, she wanted to go out on a date. And instead of going to, like, a nice restaurant, like, most people want to go to a nice restaurant for their first date. Mm -hmm. She's like, I want to go to the shittiest dive bar you could possibly find and watch you get in a knife fight for our first date. Oh, yeah. And people are in chat are saying Solution's in on it. Totally. Right. Solution would know a hell or a shitty bar. She oh, knows yeah. this is like a compromise. Because I think that there's a, I don't have it in front of me, but I think there's a moment where she gets really tense and then she walks in and relaxes a little bit. She's like, oh, okay, this is, this isn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. This isn't like a hell hell. Yeah. She definitely is not going to call Matt on this particular lie. She's like, whew, okay. Just a dive bar. I can work with this. Mm hmm. And I'm not, I'm not sure that's actually on the page or if I just made it up, I'll be honest. I think you just made it up, but it's definitely the vibe. Because there's uh, uh -huh, no way she uh -huh. doesn't know. There's no way uh -huh. Solution doesn't know. And she could totally call Matt out, but she doesn't want Tuan going into a hell any more than Matt does. So if Tuan's right. willing to buy this, Solution's not going to pop that illusion. Hell no. Hell no. Um <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, Tuan uses this opportunity to really ask Matt a bunch of questions that he thinks he's answering unsatisfactorily. And then she does a Tom Marilyn and turns around and concludes like a huge amount of stuff about his life based on his answers. Like, he's like, oh, I haven't really traveled that much. He's like, so you know the manners of, of courts in five different countries. <laughs> <laughs> right. You lie. Mm -hmm. And then she asks if for him to gamble for her. And he, with pleasure, gets to experience quintessential Matt, pretty woman on one arm, dice rattling in the other hand, wine cup on the table, people gathered around. Like, this is, you know, this is the Matt that we love to see. And he gets to do it with Tuan. She gets to see him in his happy place. And I, you know, if, if we have to have this relationship, I want her to have seen him in his happy place. And any idea what this game actually is? Absolutely not. Yeah, I'm, me I'm not I, a yeah. gambling dice card game knowing person. That's just not my wheelhouse. 
part of me wants to say something like Mahjong or like, because that's definitely like a matching game where you're matching tiles. But you don't roll dice in Mahjong. Yeah, I know. It's one of the games I do like. Um, and it's, yeah. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, so this is four, four dice... So yeah, I, I it's just a dice game. Like you're trying to match existing roles or previous roles or something like that is what it seems to be. Lots of games are variations on that theme. Like mm -hmm. eh. Yeah, they he goes and invites himself into a game, sits down, plays for a bit, and then one guy gets up and leaves and his partners look at him like, What are you doing? We're in the middle of like a business deal, because that's what these establishments are for is doing business deals and there's this woman who's actually like playing the shark game on them but they don't know that and it's but this guy is a dark friend and he has orders to kill this fucker right so he's gonna go get reinforcements even though it means walking out on his friends even though it means sacrificing a business deal like that's what being a dark friend means is you have higher allegiances this dude uh i, I always think of him as billy vane because <laughs> <laughs> we had billy zane i'll, I'll take <laughs> the, it sure yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, yeah. so uh, Billy Vane, yeah. Yeah, so Matt has a great night gambling with like lots of winning, and it's great, and then he feels like maybe the woman who's pretending to be drunk and isn't actually drunk might call him on his bullshit, so he very deliberately loses, so that way all the money goes back into the bar and back into the patronage, so there can be no accusation of cheating, because he didn't leave with anything. So whatever was going on, like no one got hurt. It's a victimless crime. It's fine. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and didn't he also buy everyone like drinks too? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. He buys everyone drinks. They all win their money back. Like it's just a good evening's fun and the suspicions are allayed. It's a whole bunch of nonverbal communication that like I would never notice. Like these are not the these are the street smarts I do not have is what Matt is displaying in this. These are expressly street smarts I demonstrably do not have. <laughs> And he sort of explains to 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 on why he did that and how he thought he was going to get, you know, this woman pissed off and how he appeased everybody and stopped the fight. And of course, she's like, damn it. Why would you stop the fight? I wanted to see you fight. But, but yeah, he, t he took her to Vegas and uh, she had a fun time, but was hoping for slightly more strippers. Um, and so then Tom, meanwhile, of course, is doing what Tom does, which is searching out information. And he ha comes in with the bad news. Right, so so Tuan and Solusha head off to the bathroom because it's a bar and you've had two beers and girl bladders. They are what they are. Um, so as they leave... Then why am I always the one that interrupts the podcast to go pee? Why do you sit there totally stoic like you have a fucking infinitely sized bladder? It pisses me off sometimes. I always have to go pee and you're just like, no, I'm good. Um, chronic dehydration? Oh, yeah, I do kind of chug two giant cups of tea when we start, so... That's probably mostly the problem. I am significantly more hydrated than I was as a child, but I still really struggle with being correctly hydrated. And that that explains the difference. I drink water to procrastinate, so I'm always incredibly hydrated. There are, yeah. It's something I learned in an office. You can always either get water or tea, and you can always... It's very helpful when masking in an office to be able to take a sip of something. It's a good, and it's also something to do with your hands. So when I, when at the office, I always either have coffee or water in my hands, and I'm constantly drinking them because they're in my hands. Yeah, there have definitely been times in my life when I wasn't doing a lot of Zoom calls where I was very, very hydrated because those Zoom calls required a lot of focus, and yeah, drinking water was a, a thing I could do. <laughs> so, but yeah, now I'm just like, oh, I'm stoned and stuck in my chair, bro. <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, none of the tea made me go unsteady in my legs. Unlike the tea, the Sean Chan are using on the women to find out if they're channelers here in this that which Tom brings news of. Yeah, we have a very good segue of the two women leave the booth and leave. And then Tom immediately slides into the booth where they were sitting and like starts delivering news to Matt without actually having to do a scene change. <laughs> right. Um, and so, yeah, this is the, the Sean Chan are using fork root tea, of course. And this is where I wonder, are they capturing women who would otherwise be Suldom with the tea? Are they catching potential channelers, not just sparkers? I don't think we ever get data for that. But yes, that is, no. that is where we would find out if we could go over there and look mm -hmm. at what's happening. Then we would find out. That's how we would know. And he also brings news that the Golom is still on their trail and is only a day or two behind killing people. Very, very serial killer stalkery. And then also the the 
Sean Chan are going to try to kill to him, apparently. Right. Tom right. is just a bundle yeah, of joy. There's, there's this idea that there's... They're looking for an imposter. That imposter, of course, is um, the Forsaken... Samurog. Samurog, thank you. Uh, in costume. I don't know. In Mask of Mirrors, playing her. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, Samurog has been planting these rumors, setting all of this stuff up, so that way now the entire rank-and-file army is set against Tuon, and... Matt no longer can just hand her over to a garrison and have that be fine. Now he has to figure out how to keep her safe from her own people. And of course, uh, what's this guy, Zared Elbar, is leading all the forces who are trying oh, to kill yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. that dude. Elbar. Yeah. Elbar. What a douche. Uh, so yeah, they start planning how they're going to leave. They go through a whole bunch of plans we don't get to see, which is fine, because by the end of the chapter, Matt says, never mind, all those plans are bunk, we're throwing them out, we're changing plans. So... That's why we don't get super into the details in the text here. But they talk about bringing a Ludra, about trying to find a smuggler's trail through the mountains with Vannon. That's going to become a problem later. That's why they need Varen to get them out. Right. Uh, Tom nodded doubtfully. He was not so certain how reformed Vannon was. Because he's Demondred in disguise. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Ironclad I, that's, evidence. I, well, yep. Right there. Yep. That line. Totally. That's what Tom it's is suspicious, at. and there's nothing else for him to be suspicious mm-hmm. of other than mm-hmm. the fact that he is Tim Andred. <laughs> so Lucia throws a little shade at Tuan. She's like, you could have taken care of this if you were back in the palace where you belong. Little do we know she would be dead because, you know, Semrog was killing all of her sisters and brothers. This whole, like, where she speculates who's doing it. No, it's not your sisters and brothers. It's Semrog. And, uh, yeah, and, and Suroth is probably the other one who's leading a lot of the army trying to kill her part. Yeah. Like, yeah. Instigated by Semarag, but led by Suroth. Yes, yes. A lot of the legwork is being done by Suroth. And yeah, when Solucia says, you know, we need to be back at the palace, you could deal with this, this really pisses Tuan off. And Tuan snaps at her in the kind of thing that is like a hair's breadth from being an irrevocable severing of their relationship, I think. Like, they have a serious fight silently here in this, where it's like, if she says one more thing, like, that's it. Like, someone's dying. The relationship's over. Like, it's it's a moment. Like, Solucia has been just nagging at her to stop with this foolishness. And this is too on putting her foot down and saying, no, I am going to be the empress someday. And I need this man to be allowed to prove himself as the prince of the ravens. I'm sure he's going to fucking be. Quit getting in the fucking way. Also, prophecies, right? I have to follow the prophecies, right? I can't not... You need to get with the program. You need to stop holding me back. You need to support me. Otherwise, I have no use for you. And so she turns to Matt and says, what are your plans, Toy? And he says, you know, basically, I'll find some way to get you back safely. And she goes, so you always dot, dot, dot. And they get interrupted. But I think what she's going to say is, so you always meant to free me. Oh. Right? So you always mean to, meant to set me, me free, right? Or you always, you always mean to send me free set me free because again that's the final thing that's the point she's making to Slusha is like he just has to do this one final thing and he fulfills the prophecy you see I always interpreted it as she was gonna say so you always say we'll see well that's what I thought she was gonna say but I, 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 that's that's just my interpretation I, I yours is just as likely to be true I'm not not sure which I like better <laughs> Um, so in come eight men with swords attacking the band, basically trying to kill them. Yeah, yeah. And Matt uses Tuan's name because he's startled and afraid for her. Right. Run, Tuan, which means he loses the game and she immediately notices, of course. Yeah, which, I mean, yeah, that it, that, that was the game you were playing. You did lose. That is. But this kills the nickname Precious. Thank fucking God we never oh, have to hear it God. again. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am very glad that his round of the game has has ended, because ugh. I didn't realize that Precious was only in this short four or five chapter segment. That's the only chunk in which she gets called Precious. Thank goodness, because it's too many times. <laughs> yeah, and they actually get attacked from two directions. He only sees the attack coming from the one direction, but when he turns around after the fight and looks back, it turns out that she couldn't run because they got attacked from both sides of the street. Mm-hmm. And the other side was taken care of by Tom and Solution. Right. And Tom says, 
So, Solusha, you are clearly the most badass ninja that I have ever witnessed in my life. <laughs> but also, I understand your job is to never let anyone l l survive seeing that. And I don't want to die. So <laughs> right. I don't actually know what I said at the beginning of this sentence. I, I didn't see anything. Yeah, I saw nothing. I literally have no idea why the sentence started. Um, you seem great. Um, I am a total badass I killed for killing all these, all these people men. By my... <laughs> Thank you for supporting <laughs> right. that. Uh, my ego loves it. And yeah. And so Lucia's like, okay, I won't kill you. Fair enough. Because I think she literally kills people who see her true skills. I, like, I do. Truly. Yeah. Because that's part of her cover, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. She's she's the hidden assassin. But Tom is like game recognizes game. I will not poach. I promise. I'm not. I'm not a threat. <laughs> so eight men come at Matt. I I counted him killing five of them. Oh wow! Right. Okay. So, and s the sixth is killed by two on. So there's two that I I didn't see. Right. So there's the graying man he got in the eye, a skinny fellow in the throat. That's two. A fat man in the heart. That's three. The inside, the elbow of a man built like a blacksmith, so that's, you know, femoral artery or whatever. Uh -huh. And a square-faced man as Matt sliced open his neck. So that's five. Oof. Yeah. Then he fights for a little bit longer, so there's three. And then he's facing the last one, right? So the, they don't talk about killing two more. And the last one, of course, is a woman who nearly kills him because of his pledge not to ever kill a woman again and so Tuan steps in and does the dirty deed by crushing her throat with the side of her hand which is badass <sighs> yeah just the axe blade cartilage crushing I'll just use my hand to just crush your windpipe and then let you suffocate on the ground for a bit before I decide to finish you off with a mercy kill but yeah Matt casually takes out seven swordsmen with knives yeah because he rushes them and thus negates the the space distance that they would need to take advantage of their numbers of their swords. And because he's full of the memories of some very not nice people. <laughs> he thinks that he's like, I know where men bleed the most and I don't like where that knowledge came from, but I will use it in this time. And uh, yeah, he's, he's a serious badass both for his bravery and for his ability to uh, execute <laughs> the, uh, the mission at hand. So Tuan declares herself the winner of their little game, and Matt goes, wait, what? She saves his ass and declares herself the winner of the game. <laughs> it's pretty rude. Like, she literally kills a woman, and then in the same sentence as saying, oh, yeah, I should kill her because, you know, mercy kill, she, in the same motion, turns to Matt and says, I won the game. It's just like, you are so cold. She's, she's a badass at a whole different level than Matt is, you know? And with that, it's just a readout. Yeah. Yeah, we're done. Matt whistled faintly through his teeth. Whenever he thought he knew how tough she was, she found a way to show him he did not know the half. If anybody happened to be looking out a window, that stabbing might raise questions with the local magistrate. Probably Lord Nathan himself, but there were no, no faces at any windows he could see. People avoided getting embroiled in this sort of thing if they could. For all he knew, any number of porters or barrel men might have come along during the fight. For certainty, they would have turned right around again as quickly as they could. Whether any might have gone for Lord Nathan's guards was another question. Still, he had no fear of Nathan or his magistrate. A pair of men escorting two women did not decide to attack more than a dozen carrying swords. Likely, these fellows and the unfortunate young woman were all well known to the guards. Limping to retrieve his thrown knives, he paused in the act of pulling the blade from the graying man's eye. He had not really taken in that face before. Everything had happened too quickly for more than general impressions. Carefully wiping the knife on the man's coat, he tucked it away up his sleeve as he straightened. Our plans have changed, Tom. We're leaving Madrin as fast as we can, and we're leaving the show as fast as we can. Luca will want to be rid of us so much that he'll let us have the horses we need. This must be reported, Toy, Tuan said severely. Failure to do so is as lawless as what they did. You know that, fella? Tom said. Matt nodded. His name is Vane, and I don't think anybody in this town will believe a respectable merchant attacked us in the street. Luca will give us those horses to be rid of this. It was very strange. The man had not lost a coin to him, had not wagered a coin. So why? Very strange indeed, and reason enough to be gone quickly. 
because he's a dark friend. It's not strange. It's obvious. You ding dong. It's like back to uh, his lucky night, right? When he's right, being hunted by all right. those people. And he's like, oh, they're after my money. And it's like, no, they're they're dark friends yeah. trying to yeah, kill yeah. you. And how much of that is him realizing and how much is in him just like refusing to acknowledge that and coming up with any excuse, right? Like Matt's an unreliable narrator. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was fun. Yeah, and two hours. There you go. Two hours, yep. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're on to Perrin next chapter. And uh, then we're back to Matt for a while in this book, but we still don't get the rescue until next book. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I haven't told you this yet, but we are having a guest next week. Oh, okay. Who's the guest? Yeah, we're going to have... Oh, actually, uh, in, in chat right now, uh, Barnstown is going to be joining us for... Oh, okay, yeah. I think you warned me that that might yeah, happen at yeah. some point. I have, I have managed to, to bring this person out of the memory hole that they have fallen into <laughs> repeatedly. <laughs> and uh, we've got it on the books. So, <laughs> in theory, we're going to have a guest next week. And yes, hi, Barnstown, you are in chat. Yeah, you have better, better luck if you uh, ask both of us, because if, if you just get one of us, then uh, that's like half the brain, and it's half, sometimes half the brain doesn't talk to the other half of the brain. Yeah, it's... it's Brains are hard, and yeah, yeah, we we have most of one business brain between us. The bicameral business. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?